Okay, so thank you all for braving the, the torrential blizzard, the Irvine blizzard of 2018. Rainfall. Californians cannot handle rain. <laughs> it's like some foreign substance. Yeah. <laughs> Back east, this would be nothing. Yeah. Uh, Our yeah. first year living here, and we were in Ralph's and the first rain was coming and people were online talking about it the same way in the East Coast when there's a storm watch or a blizzard coming in. Yeah. You know, everyone's there, you know, stocking up on some of the staples. <laughs> yeah. How do you drive in this weather? Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Well, Californians are a lot smarter than East Coast people because... They live here. That's it. Yeah, they live here. Um, <laughs> You know, there was a there was a request made by Hashem. You know, well, if you want the wet stuff or you know the white pottery stuff, yeah. and uh, the East Coast people said the white pottery stuff looks really pretty. So they got it. Yep. Okay. So um, the topic today is Hanukkah, the holiday of Jewish renewal. So let's get a sense of that. So we know the first source, famously, the Greeks decreed against um, certain mitzvot, right? Ata bova na'alel le'im would v'atel me'im at ha'brit asher karat lam elokeyem Shabbat Rosh Chodesh ve'mila, right? At the time the Greeks arose over the Jewish people and nullified the covenant Jews made with their God, Shabbat, Rosh Chodesh, and Brit Mila. So what do these three have in common? What is the commonality of Shabbos, Brit Mila, and Rosh Chodesh. Central to Jewish life. Okay, central Shabbat, to Jewish life. Brit Mila. Okay, yes, but, but, but let's, be, let's be more specific. In what way are they so central to Jewish life? Well, Shabbat is radical. A okay. day separate with no mundane activity dedicated to it. Okay, Shabbat is radical, yeah. With me lies in the flesh okay. and conception. The moment okay. of conception. Good, so that takes... Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, of, of things that... that uh, celebrate, indicate the, the passage of, of time. Um, okay, but Brit me lies in so much time, though, is it? Shabbos and Chodesh... Right, well, Shabbos and, and the new month, that, that's time. Brit? Uh, well, in, in the sense that there, there is a normal time associated with the performance of the mitzvah. Um, okay. But, uh, or also maybe you could say, Stephen, in terms of time, that it, it's a stage in time, you know, that we, that, that we reach as, you know, child, generation to generation. Mm-hmm. But, right... It's, so how does first Chodesh fit in that? So let's see in a few moments, right? But it seems to be that these are the, the, the unique covenantal, Brit aspects that we have with Hashem. These are things that speak about the uniqueness of the Jewish people, and it really is, like Shabbat is called the oath, it's called the sign. So Brit is actually the covenant, right? It's, it's, it's Brit Mila. The main thing is the Brit more than the Mila, than the circumcision. It's the covenant. Shabbos also is this Brit, is this covenant. It's a type of covenant that we have with Hashem that it is what we, we call that our Eidut, our testimony. Right? Shabbos is our testimony of this creator God, God's existence. And Chodesh, we'll soon see a very, very interesting source from uh, Rabbi Gedal Yeshur. But, but Chodesh also is this covenantal idea of this... Well... Let's take it back a step. What is a Brit? What is a covenant? What is what? What is a Brit? What is a covenant? A, um, 
A sealed agreement. Well, sealed. Uh, Cooperation Good, a sealed, a sealed it. agreement. It's cooperation. It's, it's sorry. It's a, promise. it's a promise. It's two entities coming together. So Brit Mila, circumcision, is a very very clear covenant, meaning we are partnering with God when it comes to the physical human body. We are partnering with God. We're saying that you do your part, but you left room for us to do our part. Shabbat. So we are partnering with God. Partnering with God in what? In what way are we partnering with God when it comes to Shabbat. What is the partnership? Use of time. Use of time, okay. And the non-use of time, the dedication of time to holiness. Okay. So I'm going to use that more for Chodesh. Shabbat, I think we're partnering with God in creation. Meaning, God created, God ceased to create. And God commanded us, La Asot. Right? God created, commanded us, right? La asot, to do. Meaning we need to stop creating comes Shabbat as an ode, as a nod, as an acknowledgement to God being the ultimate creator. But during the six days of the week, what are we meant to be? Creative, creating, involved. Asher bara elokim, la asot, we say. So that's a covenant, that's a partnership of creation. And Chodesh then, Chodesh is a partnership in time. God created this realm of time. Baruch Oseh Bereshit, we say in Baruch Shammah, that God made Bereshit, He made a beginning. He created time. Time is a realm Time and space are a realm where, <laughs> I, I, I heard it explained very beautifully on a Shia I was listening to this week. Time and space are, is the, are realms that limit, that limit us, that limit all that which is physical. God, of course, is beyond time. God is beyond space. God is Echad. And Echad draws everything to itself. So fascinatingly, right, what, what does gravity affect? What does gravity do? It pulls everything into itself, into this oneness. What does gravity affect? Space and time. Right? That was Einstein's theory. That time is also warbled. It is affected by, by the gravitational pull. What is something that has the greatest gravitational pull? What's the greatest gravity that we know of in the, in the world? Neutron star. A black, right? a black hole, I believe? A black hole. A black hole. What does it do? It pulls everything <laughs> into itself, into this one echad, into this unity, into this oneness that this world ultimately is, but time and space gives this illusion, this delusion of this independence, of this, of this separateness. Chodesh is where we partner with God in time. How do we partner with God in time? It is we who decide when the month is. And depending when the month begins, that determines when the holidays are, which determines when the Kedusha, right? We're in the midst of Hanukkah now. In those days, at this time, we revisit a certain energy, a certain potential. 
And we are the ones that establish when that is going to come about. Will Tuesday night be the first Seder? Will Wednesday night be the first Seder? So Tuesday night is at a time that one is obligated to eat matzah and one can't eat chametz? Or is that a time where chametz is eaten? Right? It, it, we are partnering. So what the Greeks were decreeing against was this covenantal partnership relationship. Because when you think about it, the, the Greeks made great steps. The Greeks were polytheists, right? Poly is many, but theist means they believed in God. They weren't, they weren't barbarians. They weren't worshiping stones and, stones and trees. But it was this distant gods that one could not relate to. One could not try to emulate. There was no kindness. There was no chesed. There was no relationship. Judaism was about a covenantal relationship with a loving God. Their decrees came against these covenantal concepts. Let's take a look at source number two, which is the Medrash Tanchuma, right? Which is man maintains a role in the completion of the world, which is the idea of this covenantal partnership. Mas had happened, the wicked Turnus Rufus of Rome asked of Yakiva, whose actions are more beautiful, those of God or of man? Yakiva replied, those of man are more beautiful. Turnus Rufus said, yeah, can man create something similar to the heavens and the earth? Try that. Yakiva responded, do not ask me about something which is beyond the capability of man. Rather, ask me something which, which is within the capability of man. In other words, of course, that which is beyond us is beyond us. But what is greater? The, and it's reflected in the, block, in the brachot and the blessings that we make on a piece, of, a piece of wheat or a loaf of bread right? which, is, which has been raised up to a higher level that is the idea of that partnership obviously we can't make the bread without the wheat from God without all the ingredients from God but we take those ingredients and we transform it into something that is far greater than simply the sum of its parts. He asked, why do you circumcise yourselves? Rehakiva Akiva said, meaning that was the point of his first question, right? How dare man interfere with the act of God? God's actions are more beautiful than the actions of man. So how dare man go and deface the body that God has given us? Why do you circumcise yourselves? Rehakiva said, I knew that it was this topic that he meant earlier, and therefore stated that the actions of man are more beautiful than that of those of God. Rehakiva brought him raw wheat and some cakes. This wheat is the work of God, and these cakes are the work of man. Aren't the cakes better than the wheat? Meaning that, of course, wheat, try to make, right, try to make a, try to create wheat, right? Absolutely impossible, Right? But God wants us to partner with Him. That is Brit, that is Shabbos, and let's see now Rosh Chodesh. Source number three, Rav Gedal Yeshur, the Or Gedal Yahu. The Greeks wanted to nullify Rosh Chodesh, Shabbat, and circumcision. And we wonder, well, why is Rosh Chodesh up there? Why is that a biggie, right? And take it a step further. What is the very first mitzvah commanded to the nation of Israel? Hachor Shazelachem, Rosh Chodesh, the consecration of the new moon. That's that's the that's the showstopper. That's that's the opening gambit over here. The Greeks want to nullify Rosh Chodesh, Shabbat, and circumcision. We need to understand why the Greeks were opposed to the mitzvah of sanctifying the new month, as this only includes arranging the order of the months. The explanation is that the Greeks want to destroy the power of renewal inherent within the Jew and the ability to release himself from habit and rote. This power of renewal is related to Rosh Chodesh and to sanctifying the new moon. As is hinted in the words we say when we sanctify the new month, that, the new month, that in the future, they, atid and chadesh kemota, they will be renewed like her. We say this Rosh Chodesh, 
once a month, on a, usually on a Saturday night, right? Soon after Rosh Chodesh, we have this, this tefillah. We have Mavarchin HaChodesh. We bless the new moon. That, the moon, of course, it stays the same, but in terms of our perception of it, it fades, 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 disappears, and then it comes back and comes out again and waxes strong. It is this idea of renewal. On Rosh Chodesh, a person given the power to renew himself like the moon that is renewed each month. By seeing that the moon is renewed, we come to understand that there is an influence of renewal in the world. Okay? I would think Shabbat would be far more potent a, a opposition than Rosh Chodesh. They, they did Shabbos also. Right? But Shabbos is Kavua Vikayama. Seven days, seven days, seven days. Rosh Chodesh, sometimes it's 29, sometimes it's a 30 day month, sometimes it's a 29 day month. But, but you know, the, the moon, to our view, gets small, 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 and gets strong, strong, strong again. And, that, and we are compared to the moon. The nation of Israel, we, we, we've been pushed to the brink, and then we come back. And then we come back. You know, it's interesting. We, um, we always read Parshat Mikes on, on, on Hanukkah. And, and, and Yosef keeps getting pushed to the brink and then coming back. Sold as a slave, he rises to prominence in the house of Potiphar. Falsely accused, thrown into prison, rises to power in the prominence in, within that prison framework. And from there, interprets the dreams, goes to the house of Paro, rises to, 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 to domination there in the land of Egypt. There was another aspect which they sought to fight against. And that is the holiness and the spiritual purity of the Jewish nation, the Jewish family life. You know, it's interesting, Rabbi, um, uh, not, uh, Rabbi Tolushkin and Dennis Prager uh, joined forces on a book, Why the Jews, about anti-Semitism. And one of the points that they make there is that the Jews normally fare better in any given society than the general populace. And he said, and they said, First of all, we have a tremendous tzedakah system in place that those who have more help those who have less. So people are, people are, are taken care of. And we've always emphasized the importance of education. So we're normally more educated or better educated or more devoted towards education than the general populace. And there are certain values that we have that, that not that there isn't um, abuse in, a, in, the, in the Jewish world. We wish there wasn't, but it's not saying that, that it doesn't happen. But the, the level of incidence, the, uh, the degree that there is um, drunkenness and abuse for the most part is less. I mean, it exists. We should. We can't. We can't fool ourselves. But it exists on a le- on less of a level, and there is this the importance of family, the Jewish family life, and spiritual purity. Rashi tells us in Shabbos, "Shegazru Yivanim." Source number four. I'll call betulot and suod lehi ba'el letafser tchila. All the Jewish brides had to first visit intimately with the foreign governor prior to their wedding night. This is a way of of of, this, uh, of showing the complete domination that they have over us and, and the, the desecration uh, of our purity. Interestingly, uh, the Balaturim on Bereshit, source number five, we know that in, in, in Parsha Toldo we speak about the wells of Yitzchak and all the commentators are wondering why are we going into such detail about these wells, what's, what's it all about? And Ramban has a whole approach. 
that each one refers to, the three wells refer to the three Bate Mikdash, the two that we've had and were destroyed, and the third one, which is yet to be built. But the Balaturim has another approach. He says, Rechovot, the third well dug by Yitzchak was called Rechovot, Keneged Yavan. This corresponded to the future, to the Yavan, to the, to the Greeks, Shegazer Shelo Yitbulu, Kedei Lenamam Epirivirivya. They decree that Jewish wives cannot immerse in a mikvah. This is in order to prevent the Jews from having children. V'nasa lehem nes, and a miracle took place. V'nizdami lehem mikvah, v'vayit l'kol echa v'echad. And each person was able to have a mikvah in their own home. V'zehu ufarinu ba'aretz. Right, that's what the Pesach says, that God has granted us ample space. Uparinu ba'aretz, and now we can be fruitful in the land. I remember years ago I heard a story from a, a, a rabbi who actually, I believe, he was part of this story. He heard this himself. That there was a family, that uh, a Russian family, that wasn't involved in the Jewish community at all. They come, moved to the States from Russia, Soviet Union. They were not involved at all in the Jewish community. And the, the husband passed away, so the wife called the Jewish services that she wanted to have a Jewish funeral. And there was like, there were no relatives, there were virtually no friends, and she was almost house-ridden, so even she was not going to accompany the Hevra Kadisha to the cemetery for the burial. But she asked before they went if she could have just a few words with her husband. And they overheard her saying to her husband in Russian, Tell them, tell them, when you get to the heavens, tell them, explain to them that it wasn't our fault, that it wasn't our fault that we didn't have any children. There was no mikvah that we can go to. So tell them it wasn't our fault. There was no mikvah that we can go to, that I was able to go to. And by the time we came to the United States, I couldn't anymore. So tell them it wasn't our fault. Can you imagine that? Not, not we deserve reward for the incredible restraint of not engaging in intimacy if there was no mikvah, but they shouldn't be upset with us. They should understand why we, why we didn't. So they wanted to prevent the Jews from having children so a woman cannot go into a mikvah. Uparinu ba'aretz is a reference to that. But this was the, the, the dagger they tried to put into the heart of, of the purity of the Jewish nation. As Ravolbi Zatzal writes in Ale Shur, the Jewish exile by the, Greeks dark, by the Greeks darkened the eyes of the Jews. We say that they were called choshech, darkness, meaning it obscured their ability to have clarity of understanding. Right, fascinating insight. Darkness, everything is there. Everything is there in perfect clarity, but you can't see it. It's there in all of its bold reality, but you can't see it. It obscured their ability to have clarity of understanding. Not only did the Greeks enact many decrees against the Jews in order to have them forget the Torah, and bring darkness upon them, but they also wanted to prevent the Jews from observing God's laws and take away their status of being the chosen nation. That goes back to the covenantal, this partnership. So they should become free and assimilate. This would undermine the essence of the holy nation. But there's another aspect here. Our response was going to battle. It wasn't teshuva, tefillah, that was part of it. But we went to battle. So, an important question is why did God grant the Greeks the power to decree against the Jewish people? What have the Jewish people done to deserve such a fate? And this is a concept that comes up often, right? always around election time, right? It's a concept that comes up often. Meaning, our belief, the Torah understanding, the Torah hashkafa, we'll call it, 
is that it's certainly not the person in the Oval Office or in any office who is ultimately, or the Prime Minister's office in Israel, who is ultimately determining the course and the future of the eternal Jewish people. It's not, you know, the, the people in the swing state who get to decide who's going to be the president. That's not making any ultimate decision. It's in the hands of God. Now, certainly we get ourselves involved because there are certain, we, need to, we need to make our efforts and there are some who are friendlier and some who are less friendly and we want to make our efforts that things should go smoothly. We're supposed to make our efforts, but ultimately it's in God's hands. One of the, one of the I think at least most overtly anti-Semitic, at least in terms of his humor and, and statements that would be made amongst the President of the United States was probably Richard Nixon, certainly up there. Yet it was Richard Nixon, with all of his faults, who sent all that we needed during the Yom Kippur War when we were in a very dangerous, dangerous situation having been surprised and the Egyptians were making advances and the Syrians had retaken the Golan Heights and the reason they didn't ransack it and destroy it and we were able to take it back and move back into the houses of people that they had over there is because they were convinced that why should we ransack it? It's ours now. So let's keep the nice houses. That will be mine and that will be yours and that will be yours. And it was Nixon who sent, uh, I believe, against against the direction of our good, uh, our good kinsman, Henry Kissinger, right, against his advice. So it's in the hands of God. Ultimately, it's in the hands of God. Yeah. Also, aren't we supposed to be partners in Tikkun along with Hashem? That's what I said. That's what I said. We need to be involved. But ultimately, it's in the hands of God. So the question that needs to be asked, why did God allow the Greeks the power to make these decrees against the Jewish people? Right? Why? What have they done to deserve such a fate? So the Bach, who is one of the commentators on the tour Shulchan Aruch. That's not Johann Shabashi. The other one. He writes, "Aval bechanaka, ikar adzera ita al shehit rashlu ba'avodat ba'avoda, ve'al kain ita hagzera levatel mehem ha'avoda." The decree against the Jews is because they were lax in their avoda, in their service of God in the temple. So therefore, if you don't appreciate something when you have it, you learn to appreciate it when you no longer have it, right? You know, a person doesn't necessarily appreciate their health until they're not feeling so well. They don't appreciate their ability to walk around effortlessly until they sprain their ankle and they're on crutches. And then they realize what a gift it was to have that effortless mobility. So if we relax in the service of God in the temple, then it was taken away from us. And once again, Rav Volbi, in his Aleishur, writes, Panam chadashot re'inu kan. We have a new idea, a new clarity here. Gezerot e'na ba'od b'li siba. Decrees do not come without there being a reason. Vagezera ba'ab mida kenegen mida. And the decrees come in a reciprocal measure. In lo'ayta ezit rashlut ba'avoda lo'ayzerot ha'yivanim were it not for our weakening, laziness in our service, if we fully appreciated, were involved in the service, then it would not have been taken away from us. Let me ask you this then. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be um, an, an initiative of the Kohanim, that they, because weren't they charged with doing that Avodah? Okay, but yes, but as representatives of the people, and the people will allow it. Correct. Maybe the people didn't always know. 
perhaps. But the, the, the Kohanim are front and center, and that was, it seems that that was representative of the people at large, as opposed to being uh, just you know, a, a, a breach on their part, undetected by the masses of devoted, devoted people. The Rambam actually writes, be made by Yitzhani, who in the time of the Second Temple, tzatz haminut, oh. right? This heresy had blossomed, the Israel amongst the Jewish people, the Yatsuat Sudukim. And that was the time that we had the Tzedukim. The Tzedukim were the ones, She'enamamim in Torah Shemalpeh, who rejected, denied the oral Torah and would just follow uh, just the Torah. And I've mentioned a number of times the, the, whole, the whole passion, the whole structure of Judaism today as we know it is really the, the, the flames of, uh, are stoked by all of the, all the Torah Shabbat Peh, right, institutions that we have. When we think Shabbos, what do we think of Shabbos? Oh, I remember Shabbos back in my parents' house. What, are the, what do you remember about Shabbos back in the parents' house? The candles. The candles. The food. Right? The, the challah. Right? All of that is, Kadlakas Nehru was lighting candles, Lecha Mishnah, all of these things are rabbinic institutions, things that were instituted by the Rabbanon, and that's what gives us the, 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 the spice, the flavor. So we mentioned last time, Yevanim, it was that they were aligned with Shvichat Dam, right? which means taking, when you drain the blood, you might be left with the external body, but the life spirit is out. And that's what they were seeking. That's what we had been remiss with. And that is what opened up the way, the door for these gezerot against us. Right? So if Judaism was under attack, the Jews themselves had not been loyal enough to its cause. And therefore, what was our response? A rededication to the Jewish commitments and self-sacrifice for the sake of Jewish survival and dedication to the sanctity, the Kedusha, of that Beit HaMikdash. Rabbi Ken Spiro, who is the, the author of the Crash Course in Jewish, Jewish History, uh, he's got a, a great Crash Course. You go to aish.com and put in Jewish History He's got about 50 or 52 of these, of these um, segments, right? When I, when I go on the men's JWRP trip, so uh, Rabbi Ken Spiro is one of the tour guides that leads uh, some of the buses at different times. Excellent, excellent. He writes, the year is 167 BCE, and the horrible persecution of Judaism by the Greeks is in full swing. The Greek the Greek troops show up in the town of Modi'in, a site west of Jerusalem, which you can visit today off the Jerusalem Tel Aviv Highway, and demand that the Jews there sacrifice an unkosher animal to the Greek gods. The elder of the town, Matityo, who was a Kohen, refuses. Even of all the nations that live under the rule of the king obey him, have chosen to do his commandments, departing each one from the religion of their fathers, yet I and my sons and my brothers will live by the covenant of our fathers. Key word there. Brit, covenant, will not obey the king's word by turning aside from religion to the right or to the left. This is from the book of Maccabees. Again, it is a recount of the events. It's not part of Tanakh. It's not written with Ruach HaKodesh, but it is an historical account. But there's a Hellenized Jew in the town who is willing to do what is unspeakable in Jewish eyes. As he's about to sacrifice the animal, Matisyahu stabs him, also killing the Greek official present. He then turns to the crowd and announces, follow me, all of you who are for God's law, and stand by the covenant. Reminiscent of which statement? Me, Moshe, Moses, me, Lashem, Eli, after the chait 
the sin of the Egel, the golden calf. So what was the response? What was the reaction of our rededication, of our willingness to put ourselves on the line for that which, as a nation, we were very, very willing to let it just slip away? So again, Ravol bin Ali Shor, Kasher Kohanim Masun Hashem when the Kohanim risked their lives for the Avoda, for the divine service, with unswerving dedication, Miyad Ra'u Shuv Nisim, they immediately saw Nisim miracles, Hein V'milchamtam, whether it was in the battle, Masar to Giborim, Biyad Chalashim, a quote from the al Hanisim Tfil that we say, that you gave over the powerful into the hand of the weak, and with the rededication, the returning of the avoda of the service, the nes hapach shemen, with the miracle of that flask of oil. And the question is asked: Why did we need that miracle? Right on day nine, anyhow, we're going to be up and running. Right, because the miracle lasted eight days. So by day nine, we were up and running. Whether you're learning, like the Marsha says, that the oil was a four-day trip away. So by day nine, there and back, eight days, by day nine they were good to go. Or you're learning, like others at the Marsha quotes, that it was a purification process, seven day for Tumat Mate, for the impurity of coming in contact with, with, with a corpse. All right? And therefore, it's a seven-day process of purification. How are we going to learn? On day nine, we're up and running. So what do we need this for? We had gone, however long it was, without having that aspect of the Avodah done in the Beit HaMikdash. So it'll be restored. It'll be restored in nine days. Well, it, the most important message is that it wasn't a physical mic that created the, okay. the spiritual. Okay. So, so some say, some explain like Ida, that in order, because a military victory can always be explained as, oh, t- the tactics, right. the surprise, the guerrilla component, it could always be explained away. But the miracle of the oil is what was a clear sign that all was miraculous. That's, that's a beautiful explanation. Rav Dessler in number 12 uh, adds a little bit to that. Ach b'mesirut nafsham shel hachashmonim Through the absolute and total dedication of the hachashmonim Alu l'madregat lishma gamor they, re, they, they ascended to the level of lishma gamor of being completely selfless. V'zot ayta siba mitit Haruchaniyat, and that was the real spiritual reason, Shemachmata, that because of that Zochul Gaber al Yivanin, we merited to overwhelm and to be victorious over the Yivanin. Uvenes Hashemen, and with the miracle of the oil, Shenirot Haminara Lochabu, that the that the can that the, that the lights were not extinguished, Harulahem Siman Minashamayim. That showed us a sign from the heavens. Shinit olamim. That there was revealed in their hearts that eternal inner light that never goes out. So it was the message. It wasn't the miracle as much as it was the message. Right? Those little lights, that light of Kedusha that we have, that light of the Jewish people, ain't lo hefsek le'olamim, right? Will never, will, will never, never go out, go out, goes out. That that is eternal, right? There's some that explain it that this was a kiss from God. It was unnecessary, but it was to show, I care. What you do is important to me. I'm there with you. When it looks like I'm not there, I'm right there with you. 
Lastly, once again, Rav, Shlo- Rav-, Rav- Volbi, Hare Zehu Chag HaChizuk. So Hanukkah is the holiday of this renewal, of this spiritual strengthening, of, of pulling ourselves together at a time when we think it's lost. Kol Mashat Niten Lana Lamod, all that, that, that which we can learn, Me'at from the redemption, Va'amilchamot, and the battles, the wars, Bechag Zeh on this holiday is who? Misirut Nefesh. This uncompromising dedication to Judaism, to Jewish life. Ilu Zachinu, if we were only worthy, were we to merit, Hayinam Apikim Echanaka, Chizuk Lemeshach Kol Hashana. We would draw from Hanukkah chizuk that would last the entire year. Kizohi Sgulat Hachad. That is the special influence that this holiday brings. We speak about Bayanim Ahim Bazman Hazeh. Each year at this time we re enter this zone. This is a zone that we re enter that we could plumb and draw from. And that is this, this ability to renew ourselves. That when it seems that we are depleted, when it seems that we don't have anything left in the tank, we see that that little bit burns and burns and burns and burns and burns and gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And we went from mechoshech, from this darkness, to or. Yavan is all about choshech, darkness, and the holiday is all about or, all about the light. Shkoach Dov, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Interesting. Okay, we'll call it over here, my friends. Thanks to all who bred.